All righty. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining Lori and I for another webinar. Uh, today kicks off our digital content marketing webinar mini series, uh, series 01 today, where we are going to focus on blogging. I am Will Jurgensen, the Director of Client Experience, and with me today we have the owner and president of Keystone Click, Lori Hyvey. Hello, looking forward to sharing some fantastic information to help you during this uh, vital time for your business. Awesome. So today's agenda, just as we walk through it briefly here, we're going to talk first and foremost about why you should be blogging. Um, not just now, but always, always and forever be blogging. Um, and then lead, that leads us right into how to decide what to write, right? Um, there are a lot of different components that go into blogging and what elements of blogging we should highlight. We're going to talk about that, followed up by the five best practices for blogging. And then lastly, we're going to open it up for some questions at the end. Creating blogs, one of the most popular forms of content for small businesses. So Lori, why don't you kind of give us some insight here? Sure. So a blog is literally fuel for the search engine fire. The more content that you're sharing on your website, uh, the more that Google wants to come back and visit your site. Um, it's also giving you a lot of content that you can then share on social media. Um, it's allowing you to prove your expertise. And actually studies have been shown that businesses that are actively blogging actually have stronger uh, brand recognition and have higher conversions at the end of the day. What I'm illustrating here is some analytics from our website. And this blog was written on our site in 2014 and it is still one of the top visited pages on our site. So the reason that I'm sharing this with you is because Blogs are not just a one and done. I write it and no one's going to see it. This is stuff that is going to help you survive and thrive for a very long time. And what I would add to that, Lori, is just that one simple way to kind of blog, maybe even right now, is to actually go in and update some of your older blogs. Um, by updating them, you can actually also update the date in which they were written. And so when they do show up in search engines, that date is a little bit more frequent and the likelihood that someone's going to click on that certainly increases as well. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's good to make sure the content is still relevant right. um, and, and timely to the, the what's happening in t today's day and age. Which is certainly going to lead us into how to decide what to write. So as you can see kind of by our pie graph here, we certainly live by the 80-20 rule. 80% of what you are writing about should be evergreen content. And Lori's going to talk us through that a little bit here in a second. And then lastly, that 20% rule applies to the time sensitive stuff. So Lori, can you talk a little bit about kind of what we mean by evergreen content? Sure. So evergreen content is the information that you're sharing that's going to have a long shelf life. And what I mean by that is, for example, that blog post that was on our website written in 2014, it's still relevant content today. And it's still going to be relevant content a couple of years down the road. Now we might need to make a couple minor adjustments to it, but overall the information is still valid. So you invest time in creating some amazing content that's going to work for you and your business for a long time. Some of the things that you can write about, uh, I always recommend think about the FAQs. What are the people that are, what are the questions that people are asking you about your business. And now this could be time sensitive information related to the current state of, of our world and the pandemic that's going on, or it could be things that have a longer shelf life that's more evergreen. Um, in today's state, you might wanna consider writing some time sensitive information to communicate how you are functioning as a business, maybe how you're pivoting, how you're adding value to your community, um, but also consider how it could potentially evolve into more of that evergreen content down the road. Yeah, absolutely. And so one thing that we always recommend to our clients and customers is just to really think about what types of questions they hear over and over again, because a lot of times that those are going to be the same exact questions that they're typing into the search engines. And at the end of the day, they're looking for a resource. They're looking for a reference um, because people first and foremost want to try and solve their problems on their own. So they want to go to the search engines and you ultimately want to display yourself as that industry expert. Fantastic. 
Um, good insight there. Ed, do you want to highlight anything else on the what to write page here? Um, there's a couple additional things we'll be covering in a little bit. I mean, there's lots of uh, the how, how to's are something a lot of people ask uh, in Google and just in general, how, how do I do this? How do I do that? And oftentimes um, that's a really good place for you to, to show up and, and we'll get into some of these things in a little bit. Um, as far as creating quality content, that's extremely important. You want to make sure that you're publishing content of value. You're not selling your services or your products. You're proving expertise by providing ex um, educational insight and providing value at the end of the day. So uh, oftentimes I'm getting asked questions uh, from our clients, you know, well, what type of content is considered, you know, quality content? Well, you and your team absolutely have a uh, skill set and expertise. So ask the people on your team, what are the types of questions that they're being asked and what types of information are they sharing with potential uh, customers and clients or current customers and clients? Um, there are some additional resources. That's why we've, we've highlighted that there's an awesome on online resource here. So write this down, uh, answerthepublic.com. Uh, you type in a phrase or, or some, you know, an offering that you have, and you're going to get a list of all the types of questions that people are writing into the search engines around that phrase. Um, it's going to be extremely insightful and show you kind of the diverse way in that people are searching for your type of offering. Another resource I recommend is Quora.com. Uh, oftentimes, if people are unable to find the answers by simply going to Google, they're going to Quora to, to just ask the general community and, and world um, to see these types of questions. So um, this serves two purposes. One, you can then answer the question within this platform. Uh, but two, you can also answer the question on your site and then be a resource in Quora and, and link them back to your site as well. Uh, most importantly is you get to see the types of questions that people are asking. Awesome. When it comes to determining what relevant content, this is an exercise that we really enjoy uh, using quite often, the Lotus Blossom. Um, and ultimately, it's another way to really kind of identify what your core offering is. That's kind of what the middle circle here is. And then ultimately what we're doing is we're making a list of eight types of questions that people are gonna ask related uh, to that core offering, right? So from there, you can really create a ton of content. Yeah, I think it's important to, to ask what are the who questions that people are asking related to my offering? You know, what are the why questions? What are the where questions? And if you can just sit down and write all of these questions out, you're going to give yourself a ton of content that you can be creating for yourself. And likely if you go back in your inbox, someone has probably asked you a number of questions over time and you probably responded to that in the form of in an email. So you, you have a starting point for some of these blog contents, likely just in your inbox. I'm a big advocate of the hub and spoke strategy when it comes to creating content. And what that means is you kind of have one central theme or content piece, and then that's considered your hub piece. And then your spoke content is offshoots um, kind of going deeper into that. So for example, I could write an article about 10 ways to get found in the search engines. Um, and that would be one blog post. And then I could write at the minimum 10 more blog posts that go really deep into each of those segments that all ultimately point back to that big hub piece in the middle. This then converts into a ton of social media content, uh, which we'll share with you about that in a moment. Awesome online resource alert again, <laughs> BuzzSumo. Um, and this is ultimately going to be where you can find out what topics in your industry are getting the most attention. And then on top of that, who is the most influential online? Yeah, Anything so, you want to add to that? Yeah, I do. So this is a, a, a freemium site. So there's, you get a limited number of searches per day on the free level. And you also uh, receive some limited information, but it still gives you a ton of content. Um, and then there's the paid level. So 
on the free level, so example, I don't know how well you can see this, but I searched the word podcasting um, and then the screenshot, and then you can adjust the time frame. you know, that this was the peak. And you can see that the top um, shared content piece or most viral piece was how to learn podcasting from the producers of This American Life. Um, so what that told me is that there was a lot of interest in how to learn podcasting and that the show This American Life obviously was well respected. So um, definitely went viral. In addition, when you're looking at uh, the influencers, you can see who is sharing that the most related content or the, has the most um, clout related to that phrase podcasting. So fantastic tool to give you some ideas on what type of content is really hot and going viral at the time. And a little sneak peek to some of our mini series coming up, we will actually be covering podcasting. <laughs> Nicely done, Will. Just thought I'd sneak that in there. Uh, so let's go ahead and kind of continue on, moving into the next section here of the five best practices for writing your blog. It seems kind of obvious, but the first one here, Laura, you need to make it easy to read. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. <laughs> So talking. some of the things, yeah, sorry, I thought you were going to tackle this one. I'll do it. Um, one of the things that's important, I mean, if you look at that image on the left, it's just really heavy text and um, it, you don't want to read it. I mean, your eyes just kind of wandering all over the place and you're, you're casually skimming it. Where the block on the right, the headline is um, clear, it's bold, it's standing out. The information is uh, chunked up nicely. You're using some bold and some alternative colors. Uh, you have a bulleted list, which um, lists are extremely easy to read. And I actually highly recommend um, considering uh, listicles as blog content types. So like five ways to uh, show up better in the search engines or 10 ways to increase your revenues, whatever that may be. And then listing it out, uh, those tend to get a higher click click-through rate and conversion rate. Also consider adding some visuals to chunk up or break up the content. So images or graphs or embedded videos are really easy to um, make someone want to continue reading. Anything to add on that, Will? No, I think that makes sense. I mean, ultimately you have to put yourself in the position of your reader, right? And you have to ask yourself if the content is easy to understand and if it's a good flow throughout the, the blog itself. Yeah, I agree. So we move on to number two here, actually checking the title strength. And we have another awesome online resource available at the bottom here. Lori, why would it be important to have uh, a, a, a strong title? Well, the title is ultimately what encourages someone to click through and actually read that. So this is um, effective for not just blog posts, but also the subject line of your email. Uh, there's a great tool, the AMI Institute, which is um, the American Marketing uh, Institute, and they have what is referred to as their headline analyzer. Um, I know if you just Google headline analyzer, there's a couple other tools that uh, are available. Some of them make you, you know, give them that your email address before you use it, but it still gives you some really insightful information as to the strength of the title of the post. Um, now I have two words on the screen here, intellectual and emotional. And at the end of the day, people are going to engage with content that is adding value to them and connecting with them on an intellectual or emotional level. So you want to make sure that you're educating them or you're somehow entertaining them. And what I think it's is important to highlight here is we're not necessarily looking for a 100% score, right? Actually that 50 to 75% range um, is pretty well qualified. Yeah, that's usually what we've targeted uh, historically is to at least get 50% in our headlines. Absolutely. Number three here, targeting more words. And I'm just going to kind of uh, remind everyone that your blogs uh, should not focus on selling products or services, but really rather help prove to the reader that you are actually the expert in your industry. And I think that that's where you're, when you're trying to determine how many words to actually use, it's really important to keep that in mind, right? That your ultimate goal here is to just prove to the reader that you are the expert in the industry. Well stated, Will. 
So this is a screenshot from a recipe that I found online, white chocolate cherry cookies. Remember when I brought these into the office? I do. And I bet delicious. you're missing those days where I keep bringing fun food in the office. <laughs> there is no doubt about it, but I've had an opportunity to learn some cooking on my own. Which wow, also that's been good great. to hear. Anyways. Yeah. It's not um, good, but it's happening. Well, baby steps. <laughs> um, the reason I wanted to share this is because as I was looking for something unique and different as a cookie to make around the holidays, uh, this one showed up in my my results. I wasn't specifically searching for white chocolate cherry cookies. I was looking for unique cookies or um, something a little different that I could try. I wanted I wanted a different cookie in my in my cookie uh, realm of of baking. Um, so I thought it was I was intrigued by the fact that this specific article showed up in my results, and then I dove into the why as opposed to the hundreds of thousands of other recipes that are online first um there was you know over 2700 words specifically on this post so i think we've all seen um if, if you're into cooking by any means or baking the recipes that have this really long life story of how this recipe came to be maybe there's a couple tips on what products to use or or tools of the kitchen to best create the experience um, but all you really want is the recipe, you know, what are the ingredients, what are the instructions? Uh, but the reason that this showed up is because of all that content telling that story. So that being said, best practices for blogs is to have a minimum of 800 words. It used to be 500, but the more words, you know, Google loves content, so you have to give them more. And make sure that you're not just using any words, but you're using words that really connect and resonate with your target customer. The person that you want to read the article, think about what type of information are they actually gonna be typing into Google. Perfect. And this is gonna be something that we're all incredibly familiar with, uh, the concept of keywords, right? And then ultimately using these keywords to optimize your post. So we'll talk about Moz here a little bit. Uh, but Lori, where should these keywords really be implemented through within your and throughout your blog? Uh, everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of places that your the language that you want to be showing up for in Google should be. It's not just having the word at one location. It should definitely be in the title tag, and that's a tag that will actually display the name of the page within the Google search results page. Um, it has to be, live within the body content. There's no doubt that you, you can't show up for words if those words don't live on your site. Um, it adds value if it's in the URL, so you should make sure that your site is set up so that, you know, whatever you're naming the post, that post name is part of the URL structure. Um, alt tags are uh, ways to um, educate um, the search engines and also any screen readers on what the images are on the page. So make sure you're being strategic about how you're naming those images and then what you're using for um, the alternative text associated with that. And definitely include um, those words within your link. So this tool, uh, Moz is another fantastic site. There's a lot of free tools in this link that you see on the bottom of the slide, moz.com free SEO tools has a ton of tools on here that is, are gonna help educate you on how to best optimize your pages. Um, they also have some great paid services as well. Wonderful, awesome. Consistent content, oh, we love this word consistency, don't we? And I think this is uh, a, a really great example here. Uh, if Correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost looks like it might be a content calendar, Lori. That's exactly what it is, Will. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. You're welcome. Um, just like anything else, you know, I love using the analogy of going to the gym. You, know, you can't do 100 sit-ups in one day and expect to have rock hard abs six months down the road. You have to be consistently doing those sit-ups every day, every other day, whatever it is, to maintain the rock solid abs. And that goes the same for creating content and showing your expertise. You can't just write one blog post on your site and hope that six months later, you're gonna get a ton of recognition and exposure for it. You have to be consistently publishing quality content in order for your brand to maintain that consistency and be known as a quality resource. 
Yeah, I think that this is certainly one of the most important aspects of all of this is that it doesn't always have to be perfect, but getting it out there, getting it out to the world and allowing uh, yourself to be a resource is, is certainly better than trying to create the perfect blog that answers everyone's questions at once. All right, so we know how to write, we know what to write, and now the question is, how are we gonna let the world know that our blog exists? It's a great question. Um, you know that old saying, if you build it, they will come. It is not true in the web world. <laughs> <laughs> the field of dreams does not apply to blogging. Or websites or anything, or business in general, I'd say. <laughs> Unless you are that magical, you know, golden nugget or something along those lines. So I'm a Damn big it, Kevin, fan talk. of sharing um, dark social which is um, something that was communicated back in 2016. Uh, Radium One did some research to identify kind of the sharing uh, and measuring and how people are actually measuring what's happening with our content that's being created. And they found, <clears throat> excuse me, that 84% of all sharing activity actually takes place kind of um, behind the scenes. And what that means is this is the information that's being shared via a text message, or maybe someone sent you a link to an article through Facebook Messenger, or they sent you a link to an article or a piece of content via email. So the majority of content sharing is actually happening um, kind of behind the scenes and not publicly. That public is, you know, I, I wrote an article and I'm sharing it to my LinkedIn or my Facebook or my Twitter. That's the public sharing that's happening. So one of the things that you want to be aware of when you're looking at the reach numbers and how like things are being shared online, um, the majority of that number is actually not accurate because it's all being shared um, behind the scenes. Would this be a good time then to remind people that they should have analytics on their website and on their blogs and things like that so they can go in and evaluate what that traffic has been back to their website and back to their blogs? It's a great time to, re to place that reminder. Well, well done. <laughs> Good. Well, consider yourself reminded. <laughs> All right. Uh, distributing uh, your blog. So we kind of, you, you really like this phrase of reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, and obviously we have the, the recycle logo there as well. So I'm going to let you really kind of take, uh, take off here. Sure. This, you, you know me well, Will. This is probably one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so thank you for letting me talk about it. <laughs> uh, I could not steal this one. <laughs> as far as content goes, um, yeah, this is one of my favorite things. So I'm going to start with the recycling or um, upcycling your content. So, uh, and, and if you've heard me speak before, you know I'm a big advocate of this, but the rule of, or the thinking that you have to constantly create something new is, is not relevant and is very untrue. Um, and actually, this should allow you to save a lot of time and be efficient with um, creating content. So this illustration here, let's say you have one blog post that's written. It is nice, minimum of 800 words, as we talked about. It's clean, um, structured, so that there's uh, big chunks, bullets, headlines, lists, whatever it is, um, very well polished. And then what you do is you kind of slice and dice that post. So let's say you have a list, you know, with eight different ways to do something. Well, you can chunk all of those out and create eight different blog posts or eight different uh, Facebook posts and, you know, 20 different tweets, uh, create a video on Instagram and YouTube talking about each of those. So your one piece of content can quickly be sliced and diced and then um, upcycled to create 30 or 40 different social media pieces. And I think this also is really important, you know, talking back to the content calendar, right? And actually having those pieces put on your content calendar ahead of time mm -hmm. um, so that you can remain organized. And then also ultimately it allows you to re remain consistent as well. Most definitely. And then the next item is to reuse that content. So we talked about, um, Will, you spoke about this right away, the uh, content pie, <laughs> and that 80% of the content you create should be evergreen content. So there are tools that allow you to simply put this content in a queue 
so that you don't have to remember to manually post your evergreen content. We're a big fan of using the tool Sendable. This is a paid tool and does require, um, you know, a little bit of legwork on the front end so that you have to uh, set up the post, but you build out the schedule and say, okay, I want one of these posts to go out um, every single day. So I always like to share the example of my podcast where I've interviewed over 200 um, professionals and executives on the topic of networking. Every single episode, uh, we were crafting uh, 10 tweets out of, so 10 social media posts. And so 200 episodes, 10 social media posts uh, per episode, that's a lot of uh, content that is evergreen content <laughs> that's built in that queue that just continues to kind of run on autopilot. Obviously, you'll want to go in and and check it. And if there's some content that has getting zero engagement consistently, then get rid of it. Don't keep it in your queue. Again, just like evaluating some of the evergreen content that you wrote blog posts on. And if you needed to make some tweaks and updates to it to maintain its relevancy, you'll wanna evaluate the social posts that you're creating that are in this queue as well. At the end of the day, if you're investing um, your you're upcycling or recycling your content and um, you're reusing your content by scheduling it in queues, you're ultimately going to reduce the time and finan financial investment associated with managing your, your digital marketing content. So why is blogging important? It's gonna help you generate leads because you're gonna be showcasing your expertise. Blogging is really gonna help you position yourself in a strong way with your brand. And at the end of the day, it's gonna generate value to your target customer, which will ultimately bring value back to your business. In summary, we covered why blogging is important. We gave you some resources, tips, and tools on how to decide what exactly to write about on your blog. And we shared some best practices for blogging. Coming up next, so we decided to give everyone kind of a little bit of a preview of our mini series moving forward. We certainly hope that you have found value here today on blogging and we'll continue to tune back in for our mini series. Uh, Point zero point two, getting started podcasting next Friday. Point three, SEO basics uh, on April 17th. Uh, point four, how to use ca hashtags, which I think is super important. And then and a lot of people either A, aren't using hashtags or they misuse hashtags. So I think that's going to be really exciting to talk about. And then lastly, feel free to reach out to me directly, will.jurgensen at keystoneclick.com. We do want to have a 0.5, but we would love to hear what people are interested in learning more about or have questions about. So we really kind of want to make it something that might be relevant or a hot topic today. Yeah, let us know what you're interested in or, or where you're struggling, what your pains are when it comes to anything related to digital marketing. And we're happy to create some value to you in the form of a webinar. So shoot Will an email and um, we'll, we'll make it happen. In the meantime, um, we'll open it up for questions. I just do wanna point out that we offer, we have this great resource, uh, it's Guide to Profits. It's 42 ways to build your brand awareness, generate leads and nurture those opportunities online. It's available um, in the form of a PDF or you can actually have it uh, directly mailed to the address that you share with us. Just go to keystoneclick.com forward slash profits. All right, any questions that we can answer for you?